I get goosebumps when I read that text. It's a marvelous passage. And here we find that Paul really, uh, his words ring with genuine concern and love. It's as though he's writing to us now here at St. James Presbyterian Church. Paul comes across clearly as an understanding and insightful and devoted friend and colleague. And Paul's first century words are timely for us as part of the 21st century church now today. As you heard in the presentation that I made just a moment ago, this Apostle Paul, Christian pioneer that he was, lived for about 18 months in Corinth, as we read in Acts chapter 18. And during that time, he lived with Aquila and Priscilla, his wife. And they became followers of this man, Jesus. They offered the use of their home, and that became the center of meeting for this community of faith. Of course, they didn't have a building like this. Churches like this didn't come into existence until about the 300s. So where did they meet? They met together in people's homes, church homes, as a meeting place for the fledgling congregation there in this very important Mediterranean city. Through Paul's faithful preaching and teaching, new converts continued to be made in that community. Why? Because people went out and shared the good news of Jesus. It was too good to keep to themselves. And so as Paul spent time and energy with fellow believers in the task of evangelizing and reaching out, the church attracted more and more people. Maybe that's what it's going to take for us to attract more people, to get up off of our comfort seats and get out into the community. Look at all the houses around here. Have we gone knocking on doors? Jehovah's Witnesses do that, Pastor. You don't do, Presbyterians don't do that. The Mormons do that, you know. Presbyterians don't do that. Maybe that's why we haven't grown. We haven't reached out beyond our own comfort zone to let people know the good news that we have and can share with them. Not that we're better than they are, but come along, inviting them. Come. So as Paul spent time and energy with these fellow believers, the church began to grow. And because of the results of his labor, Paul had developed a very special connection, a bond with these Corinthians. He considered the believers there to be a good example of what we today call a new church development. Have you ever heard of that before? St. James is a new church development. And the story of the Corinthians is a story of what can happen when the Holy Spirit moves in the hearts and lives of people who are open and receptive and responsive, who don't put up walls and say, Jesus, we don't do that here. Good things happen to the glory of God when we're open to the Spirit of God. But after leaving Corinth to take the gospel to other places and establish other churches, Paul got word. Word that conflict and division had erupted in the church. Factions were destroying the unity and the mission of the church. And in his letter, Paul alternates between scolding those Corinthians for their sinfulness and tenderly entreating them to practice Christian love and understanding towards each other. Bite your tongue. Don't say what's on your mind. Love and understand other people as you want to be loved and understood yourselves. In the first three verses of the lesson, we have Paul's opening greeting. And as he identifies himself as an apostle, called through the will of God, he not only considers himself to be called by God, but Paul believed those Corinthians were likewise chosen and called to be saints. S-A-I-N-T-S. And they in turn were numbered among the saints everywhere who confessed Jesus as Lord, who faithfully pray to God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you a question as the snow flies out there and we're sitting here. When was the last time anybody called you a saint? Never, huh? In the days of Paul, the term Christian was not known. They didn't use it. Believers at that time were simply called people of the way, W-A-Y, or saints. Now that's not a title reserved for only the purest and the best and the holiest of people. Saints are everyday kind of people. Like you and you and you and me. Who rely on the Holy Spirit to help us conform to the will and purpose of God for our lives. So when you leave here today, I want you to greet each other Saint Theo, Saint Barbara, Saint Karen. Say it. And it's not something to flaunt. 
look at me, I'm a saint. You can't walk on water. You can't turn water into wine. You can't heal people. But you are in the process of becoming more of what God wants you to be. You are a saint. You are a work in progress. Theologian and writer Fred Beekner in his book, Wishful Thinking, offers these interesting lines about this word saint. And I quote, In his holy flirtation with the world, God occasionally drops a pocket handkerchief. Those handkerchiefs are called saints, and their sainthood consists less of what they have done than of what God has for some reason chosen to do through them. I like that. In Sunday school, one Sunday morning, a little uh, eight-year-old girl in her Sunday school class was sitting there, and the teacher asked to the class, do you know what a saint is? And this little girl, eight years old, scratched her head for a moment and then remembered seeing images of various people depicted in the stained glass windows in the sanctuary. And she spoke up saying, I know what a saint is. A saint is someone that the light shines through. As we commit our loyalty and allegiance to God and confess Jesus as the Lord, the light of God shines upon us and through us, reflecting his presence and his grace, his love and his mercy in a world that is consumed with darkness and evil and sin. And as a result, we also are numbered among the saints today. In verses 4 and 9 of the lesson, we have Paul's prayer of thanksgiving. And I share these words with you from the New Revised Standard Version. Paul prays, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that God has given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Paul offers thanks to God for the believers there in Corinth with whom he lived He labored among, he personally knew, and loved as people, as family, as members of the family of faith. He knew their foibles. He knew their shortcomings. He knew their weaknesses, but he also knew their strengths. He knew their determination to live a new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he affirms these individuals and reminds them that they are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Now, if some felt superior to others because of their gifts whatever they happen to be, they are not to flaunt these gifts and to wield their influence in the church as a means of controlling other people. And sometimes that happens in the church. You know? There are family factions that at times, when, especially in between pastors, when there's a shuffle for power, people want to gain control. It's my family over your family. No, 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 no. We are the family of God together. And there's no need to wield control over anybody else. You put your time and energy to work in common with other people to the glory of God. It, the church is not about us. It's not. When I was in Parish, Middletown Church or Mechanicsburg Church for uh, 15 years in Middletown and 23 years in Mechanicsburg, people would often say, <clears throat> I'm going to Don Potter's church. What? I don't have a church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. I represent Jesus, and I hope I do a good job. Same way here. You are not St. James Church. Jesus Christ is St. James Church. We reflect that as saints in the world in which we live, so we invite people to come to Christ church. Instead, these people at this time um, were, were vying for attention. They wanted to be important. And there were factions that grew up in the the church at this time. And if you want to read, uh, it's worse than Peyton Place, uh, that that movie series back years ago. Read 1 Corinthians. These people were obstreperous. They were incorrigible. Communion time, they, they served wine. They were coming up for thirds and fourths, and they were getting drunk at communion. They were fighting over who was going to get the bigger gulp. They were having affairs in the church. They were lying about each other. Paul had his work cut out for him, my friends. And when we think of these people as saints, they're not the goody-goodies that we often think saints are. They were sinners saved by the grace of God. But Paul tells them that each of them 
have been endowed with gifts to strengthen and build up the church. They needed to work together, not for personal gain, but to the glory of God. Paul urges the people there to realize that they need each other if they're going to accomplish God's work in Corinth and beyond. To put it in the vernacular today, there can be no lone rangers in the church. I'm old enough to remember the, the movie series, The Lone Ranger and Tonto. You, how many remember that? Yeah, some of the oldsters here do. The young kids don't know what they're missing. But there are no lone rangers in the church. You don't call a pastor to say, okay, pastor, you're going to lead us and we're going to follow. You're going to do the work and we're going to... No, no, no. We're going to do the work together. Your PNC has that task at hand right now. It's a big job. We need to pray for them. When the pastor comes, we work together. Quite often people want to defer. Let the pastor do it. He's being paid or she's being paid. No, 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 no. We're all in this thing together. It is God who is faithful, Paul says. God who has called each of them and us to ministry. God promises to help bring about his will through them and the present conflicts that they are experiencing in their church. So they're working side by side, hand in hand, to the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I think these words are very inspiring. We truly believe that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they are meant for us now as the church. Each of us is called to use our gifts in the mission of the church. Through the systematic and regular giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure, God works to accomplish good things. God helps cultivate our gifts as we mature in faith. And just because you're 70 or 80 or whatever age you happen to be in the upper tier of of life, don't think God's done with you. I'm retired, Pastor. You may be retired from your work where you earn income, but you don't retire from the Christian faith. Sarah, Abram's wife, had a baby at 90. God does miracles through us. And the only limit is the limit we put on it for ourselves. Don't ask me to do that. Serve on session? Oh, Lord, that's a life sentence. Three years on the session. God calls you for a purpose because you have gifts to share. And don't say no. Through the elected officers of this church, your deacons, your elders, the pastor that you're hopefully going to call, and through all members... The church is led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as your mission statement says, your mission is to not merely listen to the word, but to do what it says. Get off your duffs and do it. And you are doing it. As I look down over this bulletin, I am amazed at what you are doing in outreach in the community. I commend you for it. It's good work. Don't forget those diapers next week. Don't forget to sign up for all these other activities that are going on. It will enrich your life as it helps touch the lives of other people for the good news of Jesus Christ. In Ontario, Canada, there was an old-fashioned horse-pulling competition that made the news recently, sort of like what we saw <clears throat> at the farm show a couple weeks ago. How many went to the farm show? Anybody? Yeah, you probably had some of those milkshakes, too. They are delicious. Anyways, there was this horse competition. The competition had come down to the two strongest horses. On a final pull, one horse pulled 8,000 pounds, and the other horse pulled an amazing 9,000 pounds. And then the officials came up with the idea of harnessing the two horses together to see what they could pull as a team. The crowd suspected that they could probably pull the combined weight of the two individual horses, which was about 17,000 pounds. But to their amazement and surprise, everyone there that day saw that these two horses together pulled just over 30,000 pounds. Those horses demonstrate the scientific principle of synergism. That is, the simultaneous action of separate agents working together, which has a greater effect than the sum of their individual actions. Now, putting that in everyday parlance... It means that we can accomplish more when we work together and pull in the same direction than if we try to do it by ourselves. Nobody can do it by themselves, not even Jesus. 
he called 12 human, very human, vulnerable men. Some days they were with him, other days they weren't. They followed him up to a point, and he talked about suffering and dying, and that made no sense to them, but he proved it by dying on the cross, and they became witnesses to this marvelous revolution of love that has continued to this day and this time. And so God relies on us to do the same. As we continue to give of ourselves through the life of the church and in the ministry that God has called us to, God's will will be accomplished. Now, it may not be with blazing, you know, sirens and lights and fireworks and crackers and all that stuff going off. Sometimes it's as quiet as the prophet says, the still small voice speaking within our hearts, beckoning to us, calling to us, giving of ourselves as much as we can. We are called to use our gifts for the good of all. And when we do that, we work together to advance the will and the purpose of God to build up the kingdom of God among us. That is our mission. That is our call. Amen.